Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Today we are going to be discussing a case that involves yet another alleged poisoning, which is just crazy that it's been happening this often, but that's where we're at right now. This case has a lot of twists and turns, it's kind of a crazy one, so with that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the death of Eric Richens. Eric Richens was born on May 13th, 1982 in Bountiful, Utah to parents Jean and Linda. He was known as a very hard worker growing up. His family lived on a farm and he enjoyed helping out with the cows and horses. He helped his dad with any type of work around the ranch, including hauling hay, feeding the animals, and fixing broken fences. Eric was a devout member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. He did his two-year missions trip in Mexico City, where he learned to speak Spanish fluently. He went on to the University of Utah, where he got his bachelor's degree in international studies with a minor in Spanish. From there, he built up his own masonry business with a business partner called c e Stone Masonry, the C is for his partner's name, Cody, and the E is for his name, Eric. This business was focused on outdoor stonework, pavers, and tiles in high-end homes. He was known to work hard at his passions in business, but even beyond his business skills, he was great at the interpersonal side of things. He had a special ability to build close bonds with everybody that he worked with, which really helped his business thrive. He loved every aspect of his job, but especially the people he got to work with and the people he got to serve. Eric grew up loving sports and was described as a serious athlete. He participated in cross country, basketball, baseball, and soccer. When he grew into adulthood, he focused on coaching. He would tell the boys that he coached to play aggressive and give it their all. He truly cared about every single boy that he coached and he wanted the best for each child. Eric was also an avid outdoorsman and a hunter. He was an amazing archer and marksman and he hunted in places all around the world like Africa, Mexico, Canada, and of course, the US. Eric was known to be a fun person to be around, always being the life of the party. He loved fully, he laughed loudly, and he lived his life to its fullest. He loved basically any motorized toy from four-wheelers to trucks and snowmobiles. He loved going on adventures and was the type of person where if there was a challenge ahead of him, he took it head on and gave it his all. He was also the type of person who just wanted to give back. No matter if you were an employee, a friend, family, or a random person off the street, you could count on Eric if you needed anything. But most of all, beyond everything in Eric's life, he was a devoted family man. He did his best to be the best possible husband and father. By 2013, he got married to his wife, Corey, and together they had three sons, nine-year-old Carter, seven-year-old Ashton, and five-year-old Weston. He did absolutely everything in his power to provide for his family, and he took every opportunity he could to grow and learn how to be an even better father. However, as you could have probably guessed since we are making this video, the marriage between Corey and Eric had some serious issues. Now, Corey worked as a real estate agent who also worked on flipping houses to sell. Only three years into their marriage, it turned out that Corey had actually been stealing money from Eric. The couple had been struggling financially at that time, so in order to afford the cost of buying and flipping houses, she started to take money from Eric's bank accounts. She also started taking out credit cards in his name and running up debts without his knowledge. But by 2020, Eric found out about it all. He discovered that she had taken at least $100,000 from his accounts and she had also borrowed upwards of $30,000 between credit cards and other loans all in his name. Then she used a fraudulent power of attorney to borrow $250,000. On that document, she forged his signature and his initials, which basically said that she could act on his behalf if there were money issues. Of course, Eric found out about this as well, and when he confronted Corey about it, she admitted to what she did. Now, Eric did have a will and power of attorney in case of his death. Originally, Corey was the beneficiary to his will and she was listed as his power of attorney. 
However, by 2021, Eric secretly changed the will and the power of attorney to his sister, Katie. Eric actually told his sister that he was worried that Corey would kill him for the money and use it on herself. So he wanted to make sure that his sister was on the will so that if he did die, he could trust that his sister was only going to use the money for his children. According to Eric's family, Corey never knew about the change. Now, when Eric and his business partner, Cody, opened their business together, both men also purchased life insurance policies on each other. This is something that's common for business partners to do. Basically what it does is it gives the business partner the funds to buy out the other side of the business should the other party die. However, by January of 2022, Corey logged into Eric's life insurance account and she changed the beneficiary from Cody to herself. But Eric was notified of this change by the insurance company, so he quickly changed it back to Cody. In addition to all of that, it was thought that Corey took at least $80,000 that Eric had set aside as money to pay his federal taxes and then $54,000 that he had for estate taxes. For those of you who don't know, when you are a business owner, unlike with normal employees, the government does not immediately take taxes out of your paychecks or out of the money that you earn. You pay them either yearly, quarterly, or whatever schedule you come up with. So he had that money set aside for his taxes, but Corey allegedly took it. Then in addition to all of this, a family member of Eric's came forward to say that Eric suspected that his wife was having an affair. Now, I haven't seen too much information about this, how he may have found out or if it was confirmed or any other details as to who it was, but it was basically said that throughout their marriage, he suspected her of having an affair with someone for basically the entire duration of their marriage. Again, I don't know too much more about this. There'll be like articles with headlines saying, oh, she was suspected of an affair. And then I look at the article and then basically it just says she was suspected of an affair. And that's really all it says about that. So in early 2022, the couple discussed the possibility of getting a divorce. It seemed to have been a mutual thing and Eric seemed to think that maybe Corey also thought that this was what was best. But Eric was sort of in the headspace of wanting to keep the family together for the sake of the children. He wanted his boys to have a nuclear family, so he wanted to keep working to ensure that he could be there for both the boys and that they could have a two-parent household. He was the boys' soccer, baseball, and basketball coach. He loved his boys, he was devoted to his family, and he said that he would stay in an unfulfilling marriage if it meant that he could be there for his boys. Those boys are truly what he cared about most in this world. But unfortunately, that isn't what happened at all. By March 4th, 2022, 911 received a call from Corey who said that she found Eric unresponsive and he was not waking up. On the 911 call, Corey told the dispatch that she was attempting CPR, but he just was not waking up. By the time the EMS staff arrived, they found Eric lying on the floor at the foot of his bed in his bedroom. And unfortunately, despite their own life-saving attempts, Eric was pronounced dead at the scene. Of course, the authorities immediately questioned Corey on what happened. And she told the police that on March 3rd, she had just closed on a house that she purchased for a flipping job. So that evening at around 9 p.m., her and Eric were celebrating. She made him up a Moscow mule in the kitchen and then she brought it over to him in the bedroom where Eric drank it while sitting in his bed. Then, shortly after the celebration drink, Corey said that she went to bed in one of her son's rooms because he was having night terrors, so she wanted to go sleep with him in his room and make sure that he stayed calm at night and if he woke up, you know, scared that she would be there. Corey said that she then woke up at around 3 a.m. and went back to her and Eric's bedroom. That is when she said she found Eric lying on the floor next to the bed and he was cold to the touch at that point. So she said that's when she immediately dialed 911 to report that he was unresponsive. In the days after Eric's death, to those who knew Corey and Eric, she seemed devastated. She was under the impression that he had died suddenly from an aneurysm. Everyone around Corey was devastated for her and especially her three young boys. 
but she seemed to be strong enough to take that grief and heartache and turn it into something positive. About a year after Eric's death, Corey wrote and published a children's book called Are You With Me?, which is a 41-page book that talks about losing someone so important in your life and the process of grief and healing. According to the description of this book on Amazon, the book intends to, quote, create peace and comfort for children who have lost a loved one. It goes on to explain that the book aims to help reassure children that even if their loved one isn't present, their presence always exists as they walk through life with you as if they were there. In the book, a young boy questions on whether or not his father is with him when he is sad or upset or during special occasions. He wants to know if his dad is there when he scores at his soccer games, at his birthdays, at Christmases, and on his first days of school. But the father reassures the boy that he is there for those moments. In the book, Corey dedicates the book to her, quote, amazing husband and a wonderful father. She went on to do an interview with KTVX TV of Salt Lake City, where she said, quote, it took us all by shock. My kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we experienced last year, hoping that it can kind of help other kids deal with this and find happiness some way or another. She talked about how she always told her boys that their dad is still there, just in a different way. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. However... As police investigated Eric's death, they found that so many things just did not sit right with them. First of all, as I stated before, Corey told the dispatcher and investigators that she was attempting CPR on Eric when the EMTs were on their way, but when they arrived, they said that it didn't look like she attempted CPR based on the amount of blood that was in his mouth. Then, when she was speaking with authorities about the night of the incident, she said that when she left to go sleep in her child's room to sleep with him, she left her phone plugged in next to her bed, saying that she did not take it with her to her son's room. Saying again that she did not use her phone at all from the time that she went to bed to the time that she found Eric. But between the time that Corey said she went to bed to when she called 911, her phone showed that it had been locked and unlocked multiple times and there had been activity on that phone. Then it showed that there had been text messages sent and received during that time as well, but those text messages have been deleted. And of course, after Eric died so suddenly, his body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy and a toxicology screen. In that toxicology, they found that Eric had actually died as the result of a fentanyl overdose. The medical examiner found that Eric had over five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death. And based on Eric's stomach contents, it appeared that the fentanyl had been ingested orally. So based on this, police were able to obtain a search warrant for the home, as well as for several devices within the home, including Corey's cell phone. When examining Corey's cell phone, investigators found several text messages between her and an unnamed acquaintance who has only been identified by the initials CL. Because of this, CL was taken in and questioned by the police. In that interview, CL told the police that at some point between December of 2021 and February of 2022, Corey contacted him via text and asked if CL could get her some prescription pain medication for an investor who had a back injury. So an investor that she worked with with her real estate business. Within a few days, CL was able to get a hold of hydrocodone pills from a dealer. Corey told CL to leave those pills in a home that she was flipping at the time, so he did, with Corey leaving some cash behind for him. Two weeks after that, by February 11th, 2022, Corey contacted CL again 
saying that her investor wanted something stronger, asking for some of that Michael Jackson stuff. Then she asked CL specifically for fentanyl. From there, CL obtained between 15 and 30 fentanyl pills from the dealer that he worked with. Corey then went over to CL's house where she paid $900 for those pills. Then two weeks after that, in late February of 2022, Corey contacted CL again, asking for another $900 worth of fentanyl pills. Once again, CL got these pills and delivered them to a house that Corey was working on. So obviously, this all does look really bad for Corey. Obviously, she was able to obtain fentanyl, and the fact that her husband died from fentanyl poisoning doesn't look good, doesn't add up. But to add to that, family members of Eric also believe that this was not the first time that Corey tried to poison Eric. According to Eric's sister, the two went on a trip to Greece several years back, and during this trip, Corey gave Eric a drink. After drinking it, Eric became violently ill, but obviously he survived. After that, though, Eric called his sister and told her that he believed that Corey may have tried to kill him. Then, the next alleged incident was on Valentine's Day in 2022. Now, remember, Corey had texted CL about the pills on February 11th, 2022. On Valentine's Day, Corey brought Eric a sandwich, but after one bite, Eric broke out into hives and he could not breathe. He ended up having to use his son's EpiPen and Benadryl to save his life before he passed out for several hours. After he woke up, he called Cody, his business partner, and told him what happened. Once again, he thought that Corey may have poisoned him. According to family members, Eric was so freaked out that he said on multiple occasions that if anything ever happened to him, Corey was to blame. So, obviously, that looks very bad as well. We technically have this past behavior of her allegedly trying to poison him. We have other financial motives, but we also have information for why she may have chose this specific time. Now, earlier we talked about how Corey told the police that Eric and her were celebrating on closing on a new house that they purchased to flip. But it turned out that Eric was actually completely against buying and flipping that house. So, the house would have cost the couple about $2 million in down payments and renovations to flip it. Eric thought that they would lose a lot of money with this purchase and he refused to put down any money for it. I've seen in some articles that a lot of locals in the area thought that this house was an eyesore and a lot of people didn't think that it was going to be worth a lot. And apparently during this argument when Eric was telling Corey that they were not going to have the money to put down on that house, that is when Eric told Corey that he had also taken her out of his will. I don't know how that's absolutely confirmed that he actually said that at that time, but that's what's been reported. So I guess take that with a grain of salt. I don't know if he told family members that he told her this day or if she mentioned it to somebody. I'm not exactly sure, but either way, the day after Eric's death on March 5th, it turned out that that is when Corey had signed the closing papers on this property. So, she wasn't going to take no for an answer. She put the money down and she bought the house. Then, after signing the closing papers on this home, Corey invited over a bunch of friends for a big party at her house where everyone drank and celebrated her new purchase. Again, the day after her husband's death, she threw a party. So, Eric's sister was not having it. She actually went to the party and started yelling at Corey for throwing this party the literal hours after her husband's death. Then, two weeks after that, after buying the house, Corey put the house back up on the market with a price tag of $5 million, already trying to more than double her money. But I don't think, as of right now, I don't think she was able to sell it, and I think right now it sold for $3.5 million, but I don't know if the bank took over the house after, like, Corey was alleged to have done all of these things, or if she actually did sell it and made a million dollars off of it. I'm not exactly sure. But either way, 
Using all of this information, police felt that they finally had enough to arrest and charge Corey with the murder of her husband about a year after his death. She is being charged with first-degree aggravated murder with multiple counts of second-degree possession of a controlled substance in relation to the fentanyl. So obviously, the assumption and theory right now is that Corey had the financial motive to murder her husband. It's thought that she felt that Eric was worth more to her dead than alive and divorced. It's thought that she must have slipped fentanyl into that Moscow mule that she made that night and that he died as a result of an overdose. Now, because of the fact that this was fentanyl related, a lot of people have suggested that maybe he took the fentanyl on his own, but his family said that there's absolutely no way that he took the fentanyl on his own accord. He was not a drug user. He was not known to have any behaviors that would suggest that. A lot of people can hide it very well, but to me, just the sheer amount being five times the lethal limit, that's also very concerning on its own, and it shows that it probably wasn't his own doing, especially if it was his first time. You would think that at least most people, especially people with like a normal life who have a job and have a family, if they want to start experimenting with drugs, you would think, at least I would think, that they would do a little bit of research before just like taking a crap ton of fentanyl all at one time. You would think that they'd probably do a little bit of research and figure out exactly how much to take to get like whatever high they want from it, not just down a bunch of it and get five times the lethal limit in his system. Not even five times the limit to get high, but five times the lethal limit. So like he took the lethal limit and then times it by five. That's a lot of fentanyl. So it's not believed that he took it on his own free will. It is believed that Corey is the one who spiked his drink with the fentanyl and I do personally believe that. So that is where the case sits right now. She was literally just arrested a few days ago, so we don't have a ton more about the hearings or a plea or when or if a trial will take place. I do believe she is due for her next court appearance within the next few days from the time that I'm recording this, but I'm not exactly sure where this case is going to go right now, how she's going to plead. I'd assume she's going to plead not guilty, but I guess we'll see. Of course, this is a very crazy case. It's honestly devastating how the whole situation played out. It's disturbing the fact that she wrote a book about grief knowing that she allegedly caused his death. She said that she saw her children struggling with grief, so that is what encouraged her to write the book. But allegedly she knew that she is the one who caused that grief in her children to begin with, so that's just very disturbing and narcissistic to me. Also, the fact that she had tried allegedly poisoning him multiple times before. Let that be a warning for anyone out there. We just talked about the case of Angela Craig, who she had also been suspicious of her husband poisoning her before actually killing her. So, <laughs> just let this be a warning. Like, if you're suspicious of someone, if you think they're putting stuff in, you know, your drinks or in your food, and you think that someone might be poisoning you, even if it didn't kill you, if they did it once, they're probably going to do it again. So, don't take a drink from someone who gave you something and it made you violently ill. Again, I'm not blaming Eric whatsoever. I know that all he wanted in his life was to just have a stable, loving home for his children. So, I'm not blaming him one bit, but this can serve as a lesson for a lot of people. If someone is untrustworthy and they've shown themselves to be untrustworthy multiple, multiple times it's probably not healthy for you or the children to stay with that person. Either way, as with any recent ongoing case, I will keep you updated as more comes out. Again, I do think this is a pretty cut and dry case. I think she poisoned him and I think it's clear why. I think she is an evil, narcissistic monster who ripped an amazing, loving father away from her children just so she could make some money. It's absolutely disgusting and that's what I allegedly think happened. But either way, I will keep you all updated as more comes out, as we find out more about the plea, about any more information that comes out, if they found anything else in their investigation, I guess we'll find out later. But that is all I have for today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. 
make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. I do keep the most up to date with any case that I cover over on my Twitter. So if you want to keep up to date on this case or any other cases that are more recent, make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter. If you have any case suggestions for a case that you would like to see covered on this channel, make sure you go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.